Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. This is where we would usually share our Patreon information for those who feel excited to support our work and help us share informative conversations and encouragement to those who need it most. We love so much and welcome the immense support we've been receiving. But if you're out there considering donating to a favorite podcast or project, we would like to encourage you this week to instead donate to any of the wonderful groups out there supporting Black Lives Matter and promoting education and support on the conversation of race around the world. Please check this episode's show notes for a list of reputable and charitable causes as well as available health resources. And please know that we stand with you in the fight for justice in our country. Please take care of yourselves. Your mental and physical health are so important during these trying times. And we hope that with this episode, we can offer you a moment of joy. Welcome, everyone, to our first episode of our nutrition series. This is so exciting. Today, we were joined by eating psychology coach Rita Glynn. We were able to talk about how food affects your brain and your body, and we learned so much. I don't know about you guys, but I'm feeling much more encouraged to be more in tune with my mind and my body while I'm eating. Absolutely. It was so good. Same here. I loved learning all about how the brain and the gut are so connected, and it doesn't just go one way either. It's a two-way street. (laughs) It is a two-way street. And, you know, not that long ago, I remember talking to my doctor about gut health and how important it was. And that was the first I was hearing of it. It hadn't caught on yet. So I'm so glad it did. Now people are finding a way to take care of themselves in a really simple way with food. How are you guys feeling about your relationship with food right now? A little mixed these days, especially when it's so hard to get (laughs) access to, um, you know, what we want and need and, you know, makes us feel good, um, maybe in the healthy kind of way. But definitely that comfort eating has been at play lately. Um, So I think, you know, but in general, outside of right now, (laughs) uh, I felt like I've been getting there. And what she talked about just really resonated because it it kind of was inspiring in a sense that maybe we're on the right track, but also we don't have to have all the answers right away. (laughs) It's a work in progress. Yeah, I love that. How about you, Karen? Well, I'm actually feeling better about my relationship with food than I've ever felt. As McKenna mentions in the episode, um, I Mm -hmm. had an allergy test done in order to understand things that my body's sensitive to. And so it was, it was a lot of work to eliminate all of the things (laughs) that were on the list and sort of get to know what makes me feel a certain way. But she's Mm -hmm. absolutely right. And I can see that it is a very individual thing. And that's why fad diets or fad healthy practices don't work for everyone. Because Mm -hmm. if everyone's eating leafy greens, this is just a silly example, and my body has a sensitivity to spinach, then that's not going to make me feel better. And so it's not a one size fits all. But I definitely have felt better than I've ever felt before. And I think I understand myself in relation to food more than I ever have. So I would say I'm feeling amazing. That's awesome. It's so important. I I was really grateful that she said that there, you know, those diets are often something to maybe avoid or think very critically about because there is no one size fits all. It's a very individual thing and it can be harmful to kind of jump on this bandwagon. I'm doing this diet. You should do it too. It's going to make you feel so much better. What if it doesn't, you know? (laughs) Well, and of course, I have experience as a teen Mm -hmm. going through some of those things. I feel so lucky now that as an adult, I can kind of make decisions for myself. And I know that eating a pizza late at night isn't going to make me feel as good as, say, eating a big bowl of zucchini. Sure. (laughs) Yeah, a huge bowl of zucchini. I did last (laughs) night. Yeah, we actually (laughs) really did. (laughs) That's great. That sounds really good right now. (laughs) But yeah, I know that a lot of teens struggle with that. Yeah. I think that's so interesting because at least for me, I briefly mentioned in the interview that as far as fad diets, I was super on that bandwagon in my first year of college maybe even my second. I'm fine and healthy and great, so I can laugh about this now, but I think there was a study that came out about... I feel like I know what you're going to say. Sweet potatoes? Sweet potatoes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sweet potatoes were getting their moment, exclaimed 
ultra healthy superfoods at the time. Oh, so, no. you know, like every season there's something, <laughs> you know, my brain took that study and said, I can only eat sweet potatoes. Oh. <laughs> Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Only. Then on a Friday, I'd have a pizza or something. I thought you were going to say on a Friday, I'd have two sweet potatoes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Second lunch. Oh, but man. But it's just another sweet potato. <laughs> Oh, I have an embarrassing story on that note. Oh, please. Uh, when I found out about how healthy fiber is for you. Oh, no. <laughs> guess what my brain decided to do? <laughs> oh, no, Sean. <laughs> I was like, I clearly need fiber in every single thing I eat. I have to make sure everything I have has fiber in it. Remember, <laughs> right. macro and mi- micronutrients. And <laughs> I was like, okay, clearly fiber is the thing. Um, and it is great uh, unless you overdo it. And then <laughs> oh. <laughs> you <have> other problems. <laughs> Uh, so don't do that. Right? Moderation for sure. <laughs> Sean, how were you eat, um, consuming fiber? Like what was your fiber of choice? I don't know. I was just looking up all the foods with lots of fibers in it. I was putting, you know, getting, um, you know, fiber supplements and putting it on other things that didn't have it in it. Put it in your yogurt. You'd break open your supplement and sprinkle it over your raisin bran. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was living like I was 93 years old. (laughs) Get your prunes and your... (laughs) That's the best story I've heard, at least today. (laughs) So I was so inspired to hear her story because, like I said, she was a performer from a very young age. And she says that was a huge reason why she got into this field because she constantly felt like she should eat a certain way and it would help her look a certain way or perform a certain way on stage. And I think we all go through moments like that, but she made it out the other side. Absolutely. Kind of reminds me of a little bit of like Jamila Jamil or is it Tahani from The Good so Place? Much. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. How she talks all the about. Jokes. Yeah, all the jokes. Well, you know, Sean, that's funny because I was trying to think about the types of things that you're doing when you're that age, when you're a young person or a young adult, sports, dance, the arts, or just being in high school, actually, where your appearance is kind of like your main focus. And I think that's how we get sent down that slippery slope. I mean, it's it's important in college, too. But one of my favorite moments was kind of getting out of that, you know, everyone looking so good every day for high school, and then you get to college. <laughs> it's like the I'm, I'm just wearing a sleeping bag yeah. today. A sleeping bag. <laughs> <laughs> if it's a cold day, don't even. Yeah. I don't even care. <laughs> and if not, just nothing. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Um, I was also thinking about what Demi Lovato said recently in an interview about how for her birthday she would have a watermelon um with whipped cream around it, like a watermelon cake, and that until recently she hadn't had cake at all for her birthday and I found that so sad oh yeah she has a new team now who is really supportive of her and for her last birthday I think they bought her a cake and it was the first cake she'd had in like I want to say 10 years I'm not sure but a really significant amount of time and I think she got really emotional and if I knew you were coming at a bake to cake. <laughs> <laughs> we need to be a support to young people and and recognize maybe the, their practices yeah. or just make sure that we're aware so that we can be a support and love on them when they're going through those hard times and they don't know how to navigate. Yeah, my favorite part was just, you know, when she's working with the younger people, she helps with these things, just learning how to communicate and teaching those kids how to communicate. Yeah. And then, you know, in turn, helping their family members communicate with them. That language we use is so important. And like she said, she didn't have the language when she was younger. And she was so excited when she found that and she's trying to share it with others. And that's exactly what we're trying to do here too. strengthen those relationships. Really thinking about how you want to talk to your kids or your friends or your family members about food. Little things go a long way. So in a positive way, making sure to have small conversations and make positive comments about food and relationships with health is so important. But also those little moments that we don't even realize where we comment on somebody's figure in passing or telling them to eat more sweet potatoes. You know, words can be so powerful. So it's important to pay attention to 
even the small things. It really is. Well, yeah. and the um, listeners are probably going, where was her mother? <laughs> Buying sweet potatoes. Yeah, I was like, okay, buddy, I'll get you some sweet potatoes. And I would just show up. Well, I used to get her a uh, box fruits and vegetables for her dorm because you know students don't have access to all of that yeah so I probably was just like sure I'll get you more sweet potatoes yeah yes well and see I had the best support system in the whole world and I still had my moments so you know I can only imagine the people who aren't getting any support or information about health how they must be really struggling some of them What's that like for a young man, Sean? Like, did you have those same struggles going through your teen years? So I think that what we kind of talked about today about um, body size does not equal health and diet doesn't necessarily equal health either. I think that really comes into play, especially when um, when you're talking to teenage boys, I guess. Right. And it's kind of like, let him eat whatever he's growing. You know, he needs all the calories he can get or, you know, right? it doesn't even yeah. matter because their metabolism can, especially if you're Have thinner. another pizza. Yeah. And so, and I think that can impact things for sure. Just thinking about body size too, especially if you're on the thinner side. Oh, clearly you can just eat whatever you want because, you know, it's not going to impact you and you'll be fine. And that's not necessarily true either. Um, and then the other side of it, you'd also get comments like, why don't you go eat a burger, right? So <laughs> clearly you're not eating enough. So there's like no, like, <laughs> it was very confusing and challenging. And uh, thankfully my mom uh, was very into health at that time. It was a very important moment for her and her journey too. So she was seeing all sorts of nutritionists and um, a naturopath and and lots of people who are helping her um, kind of get on the right track and just eat healthy and cook healthy and teach us about it. Everybody's health journey is so individual, and I think that that's something that we learned from Rita today, one of many things. So grab a cup of tea and please enjoy this episode with eating psychology coach Rita Glynn. Health is understanding what you need. Being informed. Finding that balance of mental and physical. Building yourself a support system. Figuring things out on my own and not letting it hold me back. You do kind of have to advocate for yourself. Because health, it's personal. Hi, Rita. So excited to have you on. I know I'm thrilled to dive into all of your amazing skills and talents in the arts. But first, I'd love to hear about your background and understand what it means to be an eating psychology coach. Yeah. So as you said, I had a really interesting background. I was a performer at the age of eight, toured the country, (laughs) performed on Broadway. Yeah. So a really interesting childhood. And I think that led me to have a natural interest in health from a very young age because I was so tuned in to my own personal health and how that showed up in my performance and in my you know, my appearance, truthfully. Um, yeah. As I struggled with that, as I got older, it became more of a challenge. Um, it manifested into some emotional and mental health challenges along those lines. My relationship with food became really unhealthy. So that led me to do what I do with everything, which is dive deep into the research and into books and podcasts and what's out there along the lines of um, the intersection of food and mental health and wellness. It led me to the Institute of Psychology Eating with Mark David and to ultimately become an eating psychology coach and then to pursue my master's in mental health counseling. So what I'm doing now is I'm just trying to blend all of the passions of my life. So food and nutrition and mental health and psychology and um, movement and expression. And so taking all of everything that's contributed to my health and well-being and trying to give it back to the world and to other people. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's so great. And so interesting because I feel like I always have a hard time trying to meld all of my passions. I feel like I have both of those (laughs) sides to my brain as well. So I think that's just so cool that you found your path in both. Well, thank you. It's, it's always unfolding. Um, And it's always, you know, I'm always like, oh, this is the next cool thing that I want to do. And this is what this looks like. But I think when you can find creativity and like your scientific pursuits and, and by 
creating your own business. That's one way of being creative. Uh, just keeping that element alive, I think is really important. And like you mentioned, using both sides of your brain, it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We love it. So do you mind explaining your definition of what an eating psychology coach is? Sure. An eating psychology coach is somebody who is kind of like a food and feelings person. So you're not a dietitian, you're not prescribing meal plans or like specific individualized um, food recommendations. And you're also not a therapist, you're not using right. therapeutic techniques or anything like that, but you are looking at like, how is food playing out in your life? And how's your relationship with food playing out in your life? And you can look at like, a person's general diet and say like, oh, wow, there are some major things that you might be missing out on macro micronutrient wise, or maybe you're hyper loading on this one macronutrient and we need to fill in some gaps here. And you can look at that stuff. So mm -hmm. you're really providing psychoeducation, which I think is a really important thing to provide people with because you're putting the power into their hands yeah. um, and you're letting them you know, gain some knowledge about their own health and well-being and some of the habits in their life and unpack some of their own relationship with how they might be experiencing food in their life. Okay. So yeah, it's really targeted, solution focused, um, but really awesome work. That sounds great. I was wondering if you would be able to explain what micronutrients and macronutrients are to us yeah. just in really simple terms. Yeah. So macronutrients are what you think about, like when you think protein, starch, fat, you know, those are your macronutrients and micronutrients are more your vitamins and minerals that all of those foods then contain. Okay. So yeah, we can get into a whole topic on that, but yeah, right. <laughs> um, looking at those things are really important to ensure that you are getting balance and that you're getting enough micronutrients. Okay, perfect. That helps a lot. Thank you so much. So you're like analyzing their circumstances or looking at the big picture and making recommendations based on what you're seeing. Is that how it works? Yeah. So you, you'd have people like keep a food diary. So you are looking at like specific, okay. you know, what are you eating throughout a day, throughout a week? How is that impacting you? Like, are you noticing that your mood really drops at one point during the day? Do you notice that you're very tired throughout a specific day? Is there a food group that you're trying to avoid that you're feeling uncomfortable with that maybe could support your energy or your, or your emotional mental health? Um, so just, yeah kind of diving in and seeing what's going on with a person's relationship with their food. That's awesome. Yeah. It's so important. Not something that we grow up with a lot of knowledge around. That is true. Understanding yourself is really important. I've seen that you talk a bit about how the gut and the mind work. How does that play into what you're trying to accomplish with one of your patients or your clients? So I think relationship between the gut and the brain is so huge. Um, it's very complicated. So there's a lot of layers to how they're interacting on a daily, hourly, minute basis. Okay. So <laughs> I can explain it in a very simple way, but I think there's actually a lot to unpack with digestion and mental health and emotional health. Right. The first thing that I kind of like to help encourage people is to have some appreciation for any gut symptoms that they might be experiencing, which I think can be really difficult. I mean, I have had digestive issues in my life and I know that um, mm -hmm. that can be really hard to experience and to go through. And at the same time, those symptoms are giving you information about how you're doing. Absolutely. Um, so I really like to kind of start there by helping people kind of have some appreciation for their symptoms and not see them as all bad and something that they just need to fix. Okay. And then understand that the gut and the brain are connected by so many different nerves and neurons. And the vagus nerve is the biggest nerve that runs between the brain and the gut. And it actually sends information back and forth between the brain and the gut. So when you're experiencing digestive upset, well, first of all, let me back up. <laughs> when you're stressed out, 
your digestion is sacrificed in order to mobilize and energize your body so that you can respond to that threat. Mm -hmm. So back in the day, that would have been a tiger, but like these days it could be a test (laughs) or a work deadline. Right. Um, And so what happens is when we're chronically suppressing that digestion and when our digestion is in a chronically tensed state, we're then getting signals back to the brain that we're not safe, okay. which then makes us produce more feelings of anxiety and more thoughts of anxiety, which then sends a message back to the gut that we're still not safe. So it keeps those digestive symptoms active. Wow. So as you can see, it's like a really um, important two-way communicator, the vagus nerve, and right. um, it can be really hard to kind of break that cycle. So sometimes there's not a specific gut issue that you can just point your finger at and say, oh, this is what needs to be fixed. Sometimes it's more of that psychological component and working with the anxiety piece and learning some skills to calm the anxiety and to intervene at that level so that then your entire system can feel safe again. That was explained as simply (laughs) as I could. (laughs) That was great. No. (laughs) It kind of ties into that fight or flight stuff that we've all learned about so much. And that's so fascinating because I've heard, you know, the gut's like the second brain. And so that makes a lot of sense, that connection. Yeah, yeah. So when people are struggling with gut health and, you know, their relationship to food in general, and they're kind of showing symptoms of that behavior, then what does it look like when they start making changes, when you start paying attention to those symptoms or appreciating them? I think it's a really... um, individual process what that looks like is different for everybody you know for some people it's so you mentioned the fight or flight response and it's fight flight or freeze so for some people they're they're stuck in a freeze response and digestively that might look like their um, bowels are not processing stuff so they might need to find a little bit more energy and mobilization and an inspiration in their life, both physically, mentally, emotionally. So it might look like that. For other people, it's that they're in that fight or flight all the time and that they need to find some calm and some ways of you know, toning down energy at times. So it really does play out differently for everybody. But I think what um, people experience is just more integration between mind-body and more feeling able to respond in a way that feels manageable so their response doesn't get out of control and take over them and then they also don't get into that freeze place where they're not able to respond they're kind of able to ebb and flow with life with a little bit more ease yeah that makes sense i'm sure people really appreciate your help with that (laughs) i was saying this is a perfect day to have stomach issues (laughs) communication is is good for the body (laughs) it is I was just thinking, uh, it must be so stressful for these people who, you know, before obviously they they get this coaching, to not understand where that's coming from when they have those issues, especially when there could be so many different causes, whether they're, you know, uh, physical or mental or who knows, right? Um, So I'm sure that that's so helpful to just, like we've always talked about, giving a name to something or identifying something gives you so much power over it. So I'm sure that helps alone tremendously Yeah. um, on top of everything else. Yeah, I think psychoeducation is key. Again, like I said earlier, I think that putting the power into their own hands so that they can become stewards of their own health. I think that's just, that's really where the magic happens, not in anything that I'm necessarily providing or doing. It's just like, here, I have these little tidbits of information and like, let's give it to you and like inspire you to go get more on your own and just kind of lighting that fire. I love that. Sometimes it feels like getting to know yourself is like a full-time job. (laughs) Yeah. Oh my gosh, it is. (laughs) Yeah. Lifelong. Never ending. <laughs> so how do you incorporate movement and art and things that you love into the scientific space? Yeah, that's a very good question. So as a therapist, I take a very eclectic approach in my work with people. Bringing art, if that's something that resonates for somebody into a session, is something that I absolutely will do. I'm actually going through a movement for trauma training right now. Um, and I used somatic based, which is body based therapy. So movement is a big part of it, looking at how our bodies may be kind of in this stuck Mm -hmm. place, or maybe, you know, are we moving with flow? How, you know, even just looking at your posture Mm -hmm. can give you a lot of insight (laughs) about what's going on for you. Trust me, I'm checking. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone listening right now, please check your own. (laughs) Yeah. 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 So that's how I incorporate 
that into my work. But then in my own life, you know, I also teach yoga and um, movement is just extremely important part of my wellness practice on a daily basis. And the art is something that I'm working to incorporate more of. I've not been as good about that in my own life, but I'm going to get back to it. Yeah, it's easier to tell other people what you have to do than telling yeah. yourself. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Definitely well, because is. you're so busy helping <laughs> yeah. others, right? Yeah. 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 Sometimes it feels like there's not enough hours in the day, but I also do know, like, looking at my priorities, yeah. maybe I just need to shift some stuff around. Yeah. So <laughs> That's really great. Yeah, I know that yoga made a huge improvement in my life, and ballet and dance exercise has been huge because that feels very artistic. You're very in tune with your body and your mind. I find that it can be similar to yoga in a lot of ways where it's a bit more slow moving. And so you can really pay attention to yourself. So I'm totally on the same page. I love that. That is so cool. Yes, I'm a huge, I mean, dance therapy is a whole thing in and of itself crumping <laughs> but yeah I think bringing strength to the body as well brings strength to the mind yeah exactly so you had experiences when you were younger that sort of led you to the things that you really care about in ways that you want to help others what are some things that you do for young people to sort of help them avoid whatever situations you went through that led you to this practice I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I think (laughs) going back to that psychoeducation is like key for kids. And what that looks like with kids is very different. Um, So I like to, you know, with my youngest kiddos, I like to play things like detective and starting to look at how, if we're talking about food specifically and how that might be impacting them, well, let's track the symptoms and find the clues and turn it into a game. That's so cool. Yeah. It could be good for adults. <laughs> oh my gosh. I think games, bringing play into our lives as adults is so important. And yes, I, and t- anything you do for kids, you should do as I an agree. adult as well. I completely believe that. sounds that. fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is fun. I love working with kids. Yeah. And then just kind of asking a lot of questions. So trying not to make things right, wrong, good, or bad, but really helping them develop a sense of curiosity about themselves and how they're feeling. So emotional awareness, I think is key because that's something I was very cut off from until later in mm-hmm. life. Um, so helping them to develop language around that, I think is really important. And then also just, you know, starting to learn about themselves and question them all their own selves and um, learning how to ask those questions, I think can be really important. So my son has test anxiety or he'll have anxiety around school and on the way to school, he would say his stomach hurt. And he's done that ever since he was small. And so I didn't really make that connection for a long time about how Mm. his fears Mm -hmm. related to how his stomach felt or whether or not he was hungry. And when he was uncomfortable or if he had a big exam or something, he wouldn't eat at school. And so then he'd go the whole day without eating, which would have other impacts, you know, because you need those nutrients in order to get your brain working. And so it is, it's like a big cycle, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's where I think playing detective with like even that and saying like, hmm, so I'm noticing that you're, you've got this test and like your, your belly is hurting. Maybe let's, let's notice that Mm -hmm. and let's start tracking. Like, are we, you know, can we find similarities with other things that come up with life and your belly starts to hurt? You know, those kinds of things I think um, kids can get into, like when you turn it into a game and yeah, like you said, it's so important to start to notice that so that then you can start to work with regulating the nervous system and working to calm it down so that they can digest food and that they don't have to, you know, feel so tensed up and be walking around in that place all the time. That's great advice for parents too, I think. I mean, mom, you can attest to this, but I'm sure that it's difficult to come up with ways to communicate that to your kid and have your kid be able to communicate how they're feeling to you as well. It's only deepening your relationship with your kid, Absolutely. you know, creating those relational experiences is also very good for their nervous system. You yeah. know, as kids, you kind of rely on adults to help you regulate. You're not fully able to self-regulate. You're learning from them how to regulate. So I think it's super important to have those connections. And you're also helping them to set themselves up for those future relationships they'll have maybe with their own kids or whoever else in their lives. Exactly. Yeah, the sooner people can get educated, then the longer chunk of their life that they can just be happy and healthy. 
nobody needs to feel this way for 40 years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Karen. <laughs> All right, Sean. I wanted to ask you, having a healthy relationship with food is something that I think so many of us struggle with. Mm -hmm. What does a healthy relationship with food look like? Yeah. Wow. What a good question. I think it's it, complicated. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm wanting to use the best language as possible around this because I think going back to what I said before about not right, wrong, good or bad, you know, um, I think kind of thinking about, am I using food as a source of comfort, which, you know, that's okay sometimes, you know, like, but is, am, Answers, yes. <laughs> <laughs> am I doing that all the time? And is that actually having a negative impact on my health or how I'm feeling? Mm -hmm. And what is the thing that I am comforting myself from that maybe that's the thing that I could use to work on a little bit rather than trying to have something calm it down. Maybe I can just allow it to move through my system so that I don't need that coping mechanism anymore. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, so I think it's really just finding that curiosity without judgment mm -hmm. um, and recognizing like the flexibility of what your relationship with food looks like can ebb and flow and that it's like, no, it doesn't always need to be just a primary source of fuel and yeah. you're only eating <laughs> so that you can have energy. Like, <laughs> no, sometimes you're going to have a chopped piece of cake because it's your friend's birthday and you want to enjoy it and celebrate it. I think flexibility is really key to that, that healthy piece and feeling like you have a sense of a healthy relationship with anything in life. Yeah. So for people who are kind of struggling with that relationship with food, would you recommend that they explore different avenues like therapy to kind of figure yeah. out what that bigger issue is? Yeah. I mean, I can only speak from my personal experience. I think it's been key for me. I wouldn't have been able to ask some of myself the tough questions and to really fully be honest with myself if I hadn't had somebody holding me accountable. And so I think that when you do work with somebody who has expertise in this area, it can be really helpful to you making improvements in your life in a bigger, more profound and faster way. So I, I would highly recommend it personally. Yeah. You mentioned playing the detective game and asking yourself those important questions. Are there any other things that you think people can do at home to reflect on their relationship with food? Maybe it's a little cliche, you know, keeping a food journal and kind of seeing, is there anything that's happening when you're eating specific kinds of foods? Like, um, is there a food that you're eating all the time because it's a source of comfort? And, you know, is there something happening to your energy or your kind of emotional state when you're having a different kind of food? And is there a food that you're um, not allowing yourself to have for X, Y, or Z. I really do think that taking that time to like have the awareness around it can be super helpful. So yeah, I, I would start there. That's a great idea. You know, we're helping other people. Let's talk about what, you know, what's going on with you, but why don't we do that for ourselves too? That's really important. Absolutely. Yes. I wanted to ask you about how certain people are intolerant to certain foods and it makes you feel a certain way. Does having a journal help you identify those? Yes, so much. It can be tricky because sometimes, you know, food sensitivities or food allergies don't always show up as like a skin rash or like a severe physical reaction. Sometimes it shows up as anxiety and starting to yeah. kind of say, oh gosh, like I've eaten this food three days in a row and I've been anxious for the last three days. Maybe let me see about playing with that. And then you can go to a dietitian who specializes in food allergies and really get to the bottom of it. But it, yes, it can absolutely help you start to have some of that personal insight on your own. Wow. I never thought about it that way. That's really helpful. <laughs> the other way, yeah, right? <laughs> I ate tomatoes nine days this week. And for nine straight days, I felt like, I was, <laughs> like whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the research on um, inflammation. So when you have an anxiety or a sensitivity, it, 
produces inflammation in the body. And then the research between inflammation and um, mental or emotional health symptoms is so strong. You can go and research it. But so yeah, it, it makes total sense. <laughs> well, that's fascinating. I'm excited to do that research. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I know that mom and I have been going to the same naturopath doctor for the last, I don't know, 10 years. And she's been helping us with food sensitivity and finding what's been causing some of our anxiety. Yeah. Makes an impact. Issues. Yeah. yeah. Which has been really incredibly yeah. helpful. Yeah. I think that, you know, that's when, like, when you start to suspect something along those lines, that is when you want to seek out that medical or um, dietary advice specifically so that you're working with a practitioner who's specialized in that area. That's wonderful. Um, I have a question on that note of keeping track for yourself at home. Uh, do you have any apps or other methods? Journaling obviously is great, um, but how about any other methods or you know strategies that you might have to suggest for people? So it's not on my website at this moment, but I can provide a link for a track a tracker that I feel good about. I don't want to um, recommend any apps because a lot of them track calories and all kinds of things that can lead us down a tricky road. And I just can't okay. endorse that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so I would say anything where you're just looking at the food, right, yeah. the time of day, how you felt afterwards, mm -hmm. those are the things you want to be tracking. Yeah. So maybe a journal is actually perfect because then you can personalize it more. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Do you ever work with entire families and kind of look like, how are we behaving as a family and what are our individual needs and how do we meet all those needs? Because if it is individual and there's four people in your family and you're cooking one way or you're handling food prep or whatever one way, that could be tricky. Yeah. I haven't really worked with an entire family in that way. What I've done is more of like, working with a kid who maybe is showing like that they're either um, having sensitivities with certain foods or maybe that they don't like many food groups and that's playing out in a very difficult way. Chick-fil-A only. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. This only specific brand of pasta only. I mean, I might know something about that from childhood, yeah. but yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but then working with the parents um, and just really being a source of support for the parents and getting them connected with good practitioners and making sure that um, they feel supported because they're doing a lot of work in that kind of case. Um, so that's kind of more of what I've done. Yeah, that's really great. I know that you mentioned a little bit about kind of your childhood yeah. as a superstar <laughs> and um you said that that was a huge reason why you decided to focus on your health and that kind of brought you to this path. How did you kind of learn about health and food relationships when you were younger? What did that time in your life kind of look like? I think, you know, when I said that I was interested in health from a young age, unfortunately, I fell into that, you know, kind of fad diet mentality and thinking that, a diet equals health or, you know, having a certain body type equals health. And um, especially as a performer, as a kid, and also like a very introverted, sensitive soul, um, <laughs> I think that I, yeah, it was just, um, you know, I wanted to be as good as I possibly could. And I took what I did very seriously from a young age. And so I, I thought that all of that, you know, would support what I was doing. What I did not realize is that it did, it wasn't supporting what I was doing. And by the time I hit adolescence and young adulthood, I was really, really struggling with um, my relationship with food and the impact that that was having me having on me hormonally and just my physical emotional and mental health was really deteriorating. And the reason I'm doing this now is because I look back and I'm like, oh my gosh, if somebody had just like said, you know, A, you have these feelings and let's like become aware of them and acknowledge them and learn how to relate with them. Yeah. And then B, you know, all of this like ridiculous bad yes. diet yeah. stuff that's just, it's just not true. Ooh, I like, agree don't completely. Don't fall victim to that. Um, oh my gosh. I, I, oh, yes. 
I'm so glad you said all that. <laughs> yeah. So that's really what inspired me um, to pursue this path because I just, I don't want people to have to, you know, go through some of what I had to go through to get to the other side. It's like, well, let's just start, let's start fresh on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. That's really inspiring because I know that I started my mental health journey when I was in my teenage years and I was lucky that I had really strong support system at home but we weren't educated on it then like we are now and so when I went off to college I was in the fad diet trends and I was I was singing a lot on stage and I was doing a lot of photo shoots and I was around people who were encouraging me to you know exercise more eat less and it took me a really long time to figure that out. And now I'm a food writer. So I just eat, you know, I, I eat very healthy when I'm at home, but I have no limitations when I'm when I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And that works for me. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. But I'm a much more happy and content person being able to get to the other side of that. And I'm sure that you sharing that with everyone will just help them see that they don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. I think that, you know, we are led to believe that by exercising more and eating less, that is going to lead to mm -hmm. happiness. But like what you've discovered and what I've been able to, to discover and what I've seen other people start to discover is no happiness is like the leader yeah. and like then your relationship with food and all that, it's just easier. It's not driving your life. And, and that's not ever really going to lead to fulfillment or happiness. So. So what kinds of things are you listening to right now or what kinds of things inspire you reading podcasts you mentioned earlier? Yeah. So the last book that I read was Untamed by Glennon Doyle. And I highly recommend that book. As far as like podcasts and stuff like that, I have to say I'm a little bit nerdy. I kind of search for like what I'm interested in learning more about at the time. And then I find podcasts related to that. A ton of awesome stuff. And she is just so full of knowledge and wisdom and warmth. Um, so I really recommend all of her offerings. Um, along the nutrition and mental health lines, Trudy Scott is a dietitian who specializes in nutrition and mental health and she's always producing excellent content um so yeah I, again i'm kind of a nerd that's great <laughs> yeah. no that's, yeah, that's all really so good. informative and interesting yeah do you have any practical wisdom that you'd like to share something that you think that daily makes a difference just trying to live in that kind of a way and trying not to see the symptoms as bad but actually they're really there to help you and they are giving you a lot of information that you can work with so i think just you know remembering that like our jobs as people inhabiting these bodies is to listen to the symptoms that our bodies are giving us <laughs> it's important yeah i think when we when we find that we are fighting or struggling with symptoms whether it's emotional physical or mental symptoms you know that's what creates more suffering and it's when we can really just tune in and listen and respond mm -hmm. that we can move right through mm, really beautiful yeah really important it's been such a pleasure speaking to yeah, you. This has been so great. Oh, it's so great to speak to all of you. Well, I love what you're doing. It's so important. It's so uh, awesome. Well, thank you. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Thank you, everyone, for listening to this episode of Health It's Personal. Follow us wherever you get your podcasts for bonus episodes and new releases every Wednesday. The Health It's Personal podcast is produced by me, McKenna Udi and hosted with the Phronesis Health Initiative team, Karen Jively and Sean Tingle. Special thanks to portrait artist Alexander, musical contributor Bernie Ramke, and to our guests and experts for their kindness and bravery in sharing their stories each week. Please listen, subscribe, engage, and send us topics we can explore that would help you on your journey. Because health, it's personal.